Hello and welcome to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly, Director of Advanced Media Production at Cal State Long Beach. Today our topic is probability and statistics. We'll try to determine if it really is all about the numbers. My guest today is Dr. Omer Benley. Dr. Benley is the Associate Dean in the College of Business Administration. Welcome, Erm Omer, and thank you for joining us on Talking Points. Thank you. Glad to be here. Thank well, you as we talk about this topic of probability and statistics, it's hard to overstate the pervasive way in which numbers, statistics, and uh, probability are used in everyday life. It's everything from uh, buying insurance premiums uh, that are based on actuarial uh, tables and actuarial science. And then we have, uh, during election season, we're all inundated with statistics from both sides to try to sway our vote. And we know that companies are using massive amounts of data to determine strategic direction and also marketing campaigns. And we know that the government is using copious amounts of data to regulate industry, to solve crime and deter terrorism and things of that nature. So given that this is the case, what can we do today as individual consumers of information? Are we statistically literate enough or is there more to be done in that case? Uh, that's a very important point. Uh, uh, in, in, in my personal view, I don't think the uh, general public is uh, well educated in this area or as much as it, uh, they should be. It had been, uh, and recently with the advent of uh, computers and computation that become so easy and the collection of data is immense uh, in these uh, areas and the conclusions that presented to public of, of some analysis based on this data can be misleading. I think the public, uh, a general reader, general newspaper reader should be very much questioning uh, the, the, uh, how the data is collected, uh, based on what assumptions uh, and, and uh, the conclusions uh, that uh, the, the whoever is stating uh, the conclusions is, is based on. So it's a very, very responsible thing on the part of the public, I think, uh, to be very much questioning uh, this analysis uh, uh, that we are receiving. And today with the advent of the internet, the ability to capture data has grown dramatically over the years and it's only going to become even more so in the future. And so we look at numbers uh, maybe a little bit differently than we did 30 or 40 years ago and certainly the numbers uh, are used by all of industry now to try to determine what's going to happen for future business opportunities. Let's take for example the insurance industry they use actuarial tables and actuarial science to determine what kinds of premiums they'll be charging their customers. Explain the theory behind actuarial science and how that's used to determine those premium rates. Well, this is a very good point. It is uh, insurance, as you uh, well know, is an essential part of modern day living and it has a long history uh, that goes back. Uh, and basically those tables or the guides, how much to charge for certain things, is just the spreading the risk basically, uh, uh, is based on huge amounts of data for a particular subset of populations, depending on, on your age, for example, what is your, uh, depending on what you are being insured uh, for, uh, is uh, the chances that uh, you need to collect uh, from the insurance. So based on these huge data sets that the, the companies have, uh, the, uh, the methods, statistical and probabilistic methods, are designed to have uh, some forecast as to or some prediction, which is not always 100% because it is, you are telling something to the future. Uh, so based on these statistical uh, approaches, those tables are generated depending on each subpopulation that is of interest. And you brought up a good point that uh, although they try to predict the future as much as they can, probability does not give us an exact prediction of the future. What it does is it allows us to take a look at uh, past data and then extrapolate from that what the most likely outcomes will be in the future. And uh, another example of where this is used is in forensic science. 
Now we're going to have another show. We're going to go into the whole aspect of forensic science in great detail. And so for the viewers, you want to stay tuned to Talking Points because that show is coming up and we'll get into all of the details about forensic science. But for purposes of this topic, let's just touch on it for a moment. Mm -hmm. Forensic science, DNA analysis, what is it all about in sort of the broader sense? This is very similar to uh, the, the previous topic uh, that we mentioned. Basically what they do is they gather uh, data from the past of similar instances and uh, try to predict. And forensic science uh, traditionally being used in, in, in the courtrooms in, in uh, presenting the uh, evidence uh, to support uh, whatever the claim is in, in question. So they basically, again, they look at the huge amounts of data that had been generated for that particular area. And, and then they make a prediction or they have a likelihood of whatever the, the conclusion is. Again, exactly, it is not 100%. So sometimes the way that is also reported to public in the case of famous court cases, for example, is, is, can be misleading. So probably when, you, when someone reads it in uh, regular English, it is very difficult to differentiate what is exactly meant by the, the expert's uh, opinion on, say, DNA uh, testing and the similar results. Right, and we should talk about that for just a moment. If they talk about a DNA match, we've all watched CSI, the various right, programs right, about right, CSI, right. which are very popular on television. But uh, they talk about we have a DNA match. Well, that's not exactly correct. It's not 100% because what the, the CSI forensic analysis is really telling us is that the likelihood that this particular suspect committed the crime is very high based on the analysis of the DNA structure that was um, exhibited in the evidence. However, there may be 10 other people in the world that have similar uh, DNA structure uh, profiles but since those 10 people don't live in the vicinity and this suspect does live in the vicinity at the time the crime was committed, we're going to call that a match. Exactly. Uh, and that is why it is so important that someone, jury for example, would decide uh, on the likelihood of this crime is being committed by this result. So all of these are decision aids to decision makers in the case of the jury or, or the judge uh, to make a decision. So it is not a hundred percent certainty because we live in a probabilistic world and everything is based on likelihoods. So you, uh, the, these sciences uh, do not give an exact hundred percent uh, accurate uh, uh, conclusions. Well, I think this topic came up in another show that we did where we said the science is digital but our lives are are um, analog, analog. right? We're analog people well, in a digital world. Exactly. exactly. Um, in terms of the numbers. Uh, let's move to another topic, which is gambling, because mm -hmm. gambling is all about probability. Mm -hmm. And uh, for those that spend time in the casino, they know that they usually walk out a loser. And, but there's a certain investment of time and entertainment value that goes along with that. So you assume a risk when you go in the casino. And uh, so people apparently assume that the entertainment value outweighs the risk of losing the money. Exactly. The thing is that as, as uh, the odds that certain things say, the, uh, in, in gambling, is, again, it's based on probabilistic odds. And those odds are either formalized through some theory, uh, and in some other cases, it's based on statistical uh, analysis of past information. Again, it's very similar to the other uh, sciences that we have been uh, we have been talking about is that looking at the past or the the theory behind it, how to predict something. This is how, for example, a, a gambler uh, bets on uh, ho however much uh, he or she is betting on a particular case, the, the, uh, based on the intuition or just the uh, past experience. So, but the fact that it should, as you uh, put it. Uh, very well uh, is, is the fact that the gambling is especially playing against the casinos. One should not expect uh, to, to beat the casino. Uh, the idea here is that uh, one should always remember the uh, entertainment value for uh, attending such uh, uh, events rather than trying to beat the uh, casino or hoping to beat the casino is. Uh, Right, the house always wins, and, and the main reason is because they have such deep pockets. Exactly. We can't hope to compete with, with what they have in terms of resources. Exactly, exactly. 
And uh, when the California lottery came into existence back in the 1980s, I remember they were talking about the statistics and the probability mm -hmm. of, of winning the lottery. And at that time, I believe the statistic was 14 million to one, meaning that if you bought a lottery ticket, your chances were 14 million out of one that you would win. And uh, as an analysis comparative to that, someone stated the fact that, well, the chances of you winning the lottery are about the same as being struck by lightning, not once, but three times in three different locations. So in other words, you'd have to be struck by lightning three times in three different locations to have the same odds of winning the lottery. Which reminds me, if you, if you do survive three lightning strikes, maybe you should buy a lottery ticket. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> but uh, moving along here, I guess we can also uh, use statistics to mislead people intentionally if we want to, if we're in a marketing camp, if we're with a marketing campaign and we're trying to sell a product, we can use a a statistic that is technically true, but not an accurate representation of what really exists in the real world. For example, you might see a diet weight loss product that says, if you use our product, you have three times greater chance of losing weight. Well, if you look at the analysis comparing the other products, uh, your initial opportunity to lose weight might be one out of 100. But with this product that has three times greater, it's now three times out of 100. So that's three times greater, but you still have a 97% chance of failure in this case. Absolutely, and this is, is, is a very important point, especially in the business world. Uh, and this, this, uh, it is not, as you said, it's not technically incorrect what they have stated in that, but it is, uh, it's really opens the, the doors for misunderstanding by general public. Now, is this an ethical issue? Is this is it proper to say that, knowing that what an ordinary person would interpret the result is a very important issue. For that uh, uh, point, it's very important in our uh, business uh, education, uh, educating business professionals. We do have uh, programs, uh, ethics across the curriculum in every course that there is an ethical aspect. And we are trying to educate our uh, students, the future business professionals, uh, is this an ethical uh, statement or not? Uh, so this is uh, something that uh, is, is uh, very important. If one says technically correct things, but nobody really has, like in that example that you mentioned, uh, is no who are going to look at the data. In these commercials, the data where this conclusion comes from is not really given. If one has to find that data, then the results are you know, 97 percent. But so this is something the public should really question and some other uh, uh, mechanism should be inherent in our uh, advertising and other practices uh, to, to uh, have some sort of control over these things. We're going to have to take a break right now and stay with us when we come back. We'll continue this conversation about big business, big government, ethics, and probability. Stay tuned. We have a job to do out here today. To be a winning team, you have to work like a winning team. My team depends on me. And my team is 50,000 strong. Looks like a lot of work's going into this. This is what it feels like to be part of a team. A winning team. The action team. Are we ready? Action team. Get in on the action at actionteam.org. Are you in? Welcome back to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly. My guest today is Dr. Omer Benley. He is the Associate Dean of the College of Business Administration. And uh, before the break, Omer, we were talking about uh, the ethics of big business and using statistics, especially when they use those in a misleading fashion. Let's talk about that for a moment. Uh, a lot of times the statistics can be manipulated just by changing the scale upon which they're presented. Talk about that for a moment in terms of bar charts and things of that nature. Yes, the, the thing is, as we were talking about, the exact information that is presented to the public is correct, uh, accurate uh, in the sense that, but its implications may be different. For example, the simple example would be a bar chart. You are comparing two uh, cases, two uh, uh, products, performance. If you would like to minimize the differences, suppose they are 10 points apart. So by changing the units or the scale on the, the mm -hmm. vertical axis, 
you can make that 10 points uh, difference, a, a big significant visual uh, difference by making the, the total from 20 points, say half as much. Although you uh, uh, label the vertical axis accurately, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you would like to minimize the difference, then you would start using, say, a 10, 100 or, or 200 units on the vertical axis. So then the, the difference between these two bars would be minimized. Both are accurate information, but is, uh, is misleading in one sense or another. And in many cases, we look at charts and diagrams, like in the front page of a newspaper, you see the, these things, and if the, your visual image is what it stays with you, the differences. So this we have to be very careful about, and again goes back to how well the public is educated in differentiating or questioning the accuracy or how that data is done, what are the assumptions this uh, presenter is basing on. So this is a very, very important issue, and it appears and happens in many, many of these analyses based on statistical data and information. So when you see a, a bar chart presented in an advertisement, you have to really uh, put your thinking cap on, and it's buyer beware. Exactly. You have to check the units uh, accurately and how the data is collected is uh, a further questioning that uh, should be done. Uh, and uh, uh, based on what? Is it, is it the uh, representative of uh, the, the, the population that the, the uh, presenter is implicating? So all these things are extremely important in, in uh, uh, how not to lie with statistics. And, and a lot of this depends on sample size as well, because yes. sample size really determines how a study turns out. Because if the sample size is small, but the results are dramatic, that means one thing. But if the sample size is huge and the results aren't dramatic, that means something else. Exactly. And the thing is that although there are certain guidelines what the sample sizes should be, for example, in medical uh, diagnosis checking or, or randomized testing, uh, but these things are not really uh, based on exact science. These are the, the general custom uh, the guidelines that had been established, uh, general practices in different fields. So in many cases, especially in certain uh, drug testing, for example, the sample sizes are very, very small. So the statistical sig significance of these uh, at uh, times are questionable. And that's why, for example, sometimes we have one uh, test results in one direction and the other test is done in a different uh, population is uh, completely to the contrary. So these things are, again, coming back to our uh, general theme, is that all these analyses are not exact. Uh, so the thing is that, as, as uh, 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 someone said, the mathematics, uh, the pure mathematics is, is uh, for an imaginary world. Statistics is for the real world. Because of the real world is so complicated mm -hmm. uh, that we can only give uh, statistical uh, or, uh, answers to uh, the questions that we face. Right, and so what you're saying explains why we read in the newspaper one day that chocolate is bad for you, and then six months later we read another story where it says, no, chocolate's actually good, good for, for you. you. It's good for your heart. Uh, so it goes back and forth. And a lot of it has, uh, it has a lot to do with the sample size, how the study was conducted, and the range of time in which the study was right. conducted as well. Right. And, and like, for example, sometimes even certain drug companies or uh, chocolate manufacturers sponsor these uh, testing. But most of them are, are, I believe, quite honest in this, although the, the, the uh, public questions the fact that if, if uh, a particular study that is done in some uh, institution uh, sponsored by Nestle Corporation, could they really trust it? I believe they can. The problem is not because Nestle is sponsoring, in my opinion. Uh, but because of the certain approaches that we use are not exact. Again, it is just uh, uh, certain indicators rather than uh, absolute conclusions. So I guess in the ideal world that you mentioned a moment ago, in the ideal world, I guess full disclosure 
would be the best thing possible. Yes, yes. And, and the thing is that, again, uh, that full disclosure should be made openly, not in a very fine print. Uh, uh, you shouldn't have to search to find exactly. out the stuff that really matters. Right. It should be up front. Right. Right. That would be important. So in terms of, back to this question of ethics, businesses, uh, of course, will do whatever they can to increase sales within reason, within the law, if they can. But uh, it seems to me that from an ethical consideration, if you look at the bigger picture, companies, it's in their best interest to be as truthful as they can be because consumers are not entirely stupid. I mean, they are going to draw some conclusions after experiencing the effects of a product or using a product, et cetera. And so isn't it in their, really in their best interest long term, to be honest? Yes, and not only that, there has been some research in many fields, like the, I know marketing, a colleague of ours in, in our college is, is doing research on this, is, is the fact that if you uh, use ethical principles in, in your business practices, your profits are higher, and this thing is, is uh, academically proven that that is the case. And, and there are a number of, that's not my area of research, but there had been academic research that supports the idea that if you do uh, uh, business practices that is good, sustainable, environmentally safe, in addition to the fact that if they are ethical in the long run, it can be scientifically shown that you, your profits will be better uh, as long as you are planning to stay in this business for some time. It's not just um, you know, start the business and then close it in a couple of months. Exactly, and, and uh, any business that, the, uh, the more they mislead the public, uh, the least likely they're going to be around very long. Exactly, very true. Okay, so let's move along and talk about predictive an analytics. Predictive analytics, uh, that this is related to algorithms. Uh, businesses are using these algorithms today to determine how they should proceed in terms of making strategic decisions. How does that work using algorithms? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the algorithm is, uh, and, and some people refer to this era as the age of algorithms. You know, for a long time, uh, the mathematics or analytical uh, work was based on calculus type mathematics. But now the, uh, uh, basically what uh, that was solving a formula. Uh, how do you solve? There is a formula and this is uh, you know, optimum is equal to some uh, mathematical expression. You solve it and you get the answer. But many of the problems we face uh, now is based on, they cannot be solved in one step. They have to be solved in iterations, in steps. So the algorithms are basically step-by-step uh, -step procedures to solving a problem. And these steps must be well-defined uh, They are uh, so that one can program them to, for a computer. It doesn't, they don't, they cannot be vague steps. They have to be expressed. And after a finite number of steps, iterations, uh, the, the answer is obtained. Now, the, sometimes the uh, answer is, is not the optimal solution, but it is a good enough solution because of the, the difficulty in solving these huge intractable problems. So the algorithms are these. They are very uh, sophisticated algorithms that each step, each pr uh, uh, iteration is not identical. For example, the algorithm itself can flip a coin to do this step or that step and then continue. So these randomized algorithms are also a very efficient way of solving wide variety of problems that cannot other, otherwise be solved. So the, the, again, these uh, algorithms are essential in predictive analytics. Predictive analytics is, again, just like the other topics that we were looking at, they look at the past data present data and to be able to say something to the future. So these are a huge, they depend on now because of the availability of uh, inexpensive storage uh, of data. Now we store now huge amounts of data. Uh, for example, the, the, the Google uh, database is about 200 times uh, larger than the, the uh, all the books and, and other material that is stored in the Library of Congress, which is the largest library in the world. So the, uh, so the Google is continually crunching this database 
to come out with certain uh, analyses how these things are to be done. Now, if I could just, uh, we've only got a couple minutes left, so sure. I want to be able to talk about how the government can also use data mining to gather and obtain information about us. A lot of people in response to the, uh, to the um, revelations about the NSA mm -hmm. Uh, that came from Edward Snowden are saying, well, I'm just going to get off the grid. Well, it's not that easy to get off the Absolutely grid. Absolutely not. What, can, uh, what is the government able to track in terms of uh, what we do with the, mm -hmm. the Internet and with cell phones? Well, uh, the thing is that, as, as you uh, mentioned, the, the using a cell phone by itself is, is the uh, data is being uh, recorded in uh, every form. Uh, and if you uh, visit certain sites on the uh, internet, uh, that can be traceable. So there are a number of issues uh, that are dealing, and this uh, information is, is being stored in, in telephone companies or the, the service providers as well as the internet uh, uh, service providers. Uh, the question is that how is this information that had been gathered is being used? in the positive direction or harmful to the public interests? That is, I think, the major question that uh, we or everyone is currently debating about. And it's going to be a question that we'll be dealing with for a long time, I have a feeling. Absolutely. And unfortunately, we're out of time, although this has been fascinating. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And thank you for joining us for this edition of Talking Points. Join us again soon for another episode. Until then, I'm Dave Kelly. Have a nice day.